Hi, everyone, this is the Encyclopedia Channel. This program interprets the first classic of psychology and the interpretation of dreams for you. The author of this book is the pioneer of psychoanalysis and the originator of modern psychology, Sigmund Freud. Through a comprehensive analysis of dreams in the book, he proposed that dreams are meaningful mental activities, which are the psychological process of satisfying desires through various disguise means. So, how do dreams form? What do dreams reveal to us about the spiritual world? Today, more than a hundred years later, what should we think of this set of theories put forward by Freud? After watching this video, you will know the answer. It can be said that since the development of modern psychology, although there are many schools of thought, there are many capable masters, but in terms of social influence, no one can compare with Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis. To this day, even a layman in psychology has more or less heard the name Freud. He and the psychoanalysis he created not only had an extremely profound impact on the development of modern psychology, but also penetrated into all aspects of modern society's thinking, culture, art, etc. becoming a phenomenon-level existence. Speaking of Freud and even the masterpieces of psychoanalysis, I am afraid that the first thing most people think of is the interpretation of dreams. The publication of this book marks the beginning of psychoanalytic theory, which has epoch-making significance in the history of psychology. Freud broke through thousands of years of human ignorance of his own dreams and opened the door to the human spiritual world through his extremely in-depth insight and meticulous analysis of the psychological activity of dreams. It is no exaggeration to say that Freud has changed the world since then, and the achievement of founding the school of psychoanalysis alone is enough to make him famous in history. The famous French philosopher Sartre once said, it is only three Jews who affect the whole human being and change modern thinking, Freud, Karl Marx, and Einstein. This shows how high Freud's status is in the history of human thought. As his masterpiece, The Interpretation of Dreams, its fate also reflects the rise and fall of the psychoanalytic movement. When the book was first published in 1900, there was little interest in it, and less than 400 copies were sold in six years. With the development and growth of psychoanalysis, it has become a highly sought-after bestseller. The author alone has been reprinted eight times during his lifetime and has been translated into many languages. To this day, the sales volume of this book is still unabated, and it is a well-deserved first masterpiece of psychology. But at the same time, Freud is also known for his obscure writing, and his books also belong to the category of many people buy, but few people read. So what is this the interpretation of dreams about? Next, let's take a closer look at this famous psychology book. In this book, Freud mainly discusses the following three questions. First, what is a dream and is it meaningful? Second, if dreams are meaningful, how are they formed? Third, what do dreams reveal to us about the spiritual world? After answering these three questions, we will make some additions. How should we view the theory put forward by Freud more than 100 years ago? First part. First, let's start with the most fundamental question, what is a dream? Does it even make sense? This problem can be said to have troubled mankind for thousands of years, and many theories about dreams have emerged during this period. Freud also made a list of dream theories from ancient times to the present, and roughly summarized them into two categories. The first category is roughly the concept of the ancients. They believed that dreams were revelations from supernatural powers such as gods and spirits, and they could predict future good and bad fortune through dreams. For example, the book says that Caesar the Great once dreamed of having sex with his mother and found someone to explain it to him when he found it strange. The dream interpreter told him that this was a good omen because the mother symbolizes the earth and this dream foretells that he will conquer the earth. This point of view still has many supporters today, and there are similar explanations in many books, which is a typical example of dream interpretation with this kind of thinking. If you dream of a flood, it means that you are going to get rich, and if you dream of a fire, it means that you are going to be lucky. In short, this view holds that dreams have meaning, but that meaning is supernatural. The second type of view mainly emerged after the development of modern science. This view denies that dreams have a supernatural origin, but treats them as a physiological activity of the brain for research. It's just that Freud's previous research on dreams didn't show the meaning of dreams. They seem to be just some messy and even absurd mental activities. 
Therefore, many researchers believe that dreams have no meaning, but are just some fragments left over after the mental activity of the brain during the day goes dormant at night. For example, this mental activity is like a bonfire, which burns vigorously during the day and goes out temporarily at night, but there are still some residual sparks from time to time. This is a dream. Therefore, dreams are not meaningful, at most, they are just a reaction of the brain that has not yet fully slept to external stimuli. For example, someone heard the church bell in a dream and woke up to find that the alarm bell was ringing. Others dream of falling off a wall, only to wake up and find themselves falling off the bed. So, what did Freud think of dreams? First of all, he still upholds a more rational and scientific attitude, and does not regard dreams as mysterious supernatural revelations. However, he did not agree with the dominant view of dreams in his own time, that is, that dreams have no meaning. He believes that dreams, as a kind of psychological activity, should be meaningful, but previous researchers have not found a specific way to explain it. And Freud was convinced he had found the way, which he discovered in the treatment of psychotic patients. Specifically, through the analysis of the dream of a mental patient, it is possible to find out the root cause of his mental illness and help the patient relieve the symptoms, which is enough to show that there is a certain meaning hidden under the absurd appearance of the dream. However, due to the controversy surrounding the use of the dreams of psychopaths, some would question that this method is only applicable to psychopaths. Therefore, Freud mainly analyzes the dreams of normal people in this book, many of which are his own dreams. For example, his first analysis, which is also the most important dream throughout the book, is Emma's dream of injection. There is a female patient named Emma who once received Freud's treatment, but because she was unwilling to accept Freud's treatment opinions, her treatment was interrupted. After a while, Freud heard from a friend Otto that Emma's condition had not completely improved, and he seemed to accuse him of improper treatment in his words. As a result, that night, he had a dream. He dreamed that he held a party, and Emma was there, and complained to him about his illness. Freud told her that it was because she did not adopt her own method that she suffered so much. Emma then complained of a sore throat and stomach, which made Freud suspect that what she had was not a mental illness, but a physical, organic disease. A medical authority then came and diagnosed Emma and confirmed that she did have an inflammatory infection. Then his friend Otto gave Emma an injection, but Floyd found that the injection he gave was not right at all, and it must have no effect. What does such a dream mean? Through the analysis of his inner thoughts, Freud found that the core of this dream was actually to shirk his own responsibility. First of all, he said directly to Emma in the dream, your illness is not cured because you don't listen to me, it's your own fault. Then he dreamed that Emma's illness was actually caused by an infection, not a mental illness, so it was even less of his fault. As for why Otto had to give the obviously wrong injection, this is to say that Otto is a careless fool, so his accusation against me is not justified. Ultimately, the dream fulfilled one of Freud's desires to no longer take responsibility for Emma's illness. He also therefore proposed, the motive of the dream is a desire, and the content of the dream is the fulfillment of the desire. This is also the core of the book. Of course, it would be too rash to draw conclusions from only one example, so Freud also listed some other examples of dreams to prove his point. For example, some dreams he called convenience dreams, almost everyone I did something similar, if I ate something too salty before going to bed, I would dream that I was looking for water to drink, and if I drank too much water before going to bed, I would dream that I was looking for toilet convenience. This kind of dream is almost straightforward desire fulfillment. Furthermore, the dreams of children are often also characterized by pure wish fulfillment. It is mentioned in the book that there is a girl who went on a trip with her family. She really wanted to go to a mountain hut, but she couldn't go because the distance was too far. As a result, she had a dream that night, and she dreamed that she had arrived there. Cottage. What is this but the fulfillment of wishes? In this regard, I am afraid someone will say, maybe some dreams are indeed wish fulfillment, but are not all dreams like this? What about those painful, anxious dreams? In this regard, Freud's answer is that dreams of pain and anxiety are actually the fulfillment of desires, but the desires in these dreams are hidden so deep that they cannot be seen at a glance. He gave an example. There was a female patient whose elder sister had two sons. Unfortunately, 
the eldest son died, which made the whole family very sad. However, one night, the female patient dreamed that her elder sister's younger son also died. She is attending his funeral. This situation is by no means what she hoped for, and it made her feel even more distressed. How could this dream be the fulfillment of desire? However, Freud found through analysis that the female patient had fallen in love with a male friend of her sister in her early years, but she was unable to marry him because of her sister's obstruction, and the two broke off contact. But at the funeral of her elder sister's eldest son, she met this male friend who hadn't shown up for a long time, and found that she still loved this man deeply. So she had this dream, because if her sister's youngest son died, then she would definitely be able to see her sweetheart at the funeral again, wouldn't this just satisfy her desire? Therefore, regarding the question of what are dreams, Freud pointed out that dreams are not supernatural phenomena, but a meaningful psychological activity. The essence of dreams is the satisfaction of desires. The second part. But if dreams are the fulfillment of desires, why isn't every dream straightforward? It can even be said that, except for children's dreams, most dreams cannot directly reveal the satisfaction of desires, but only after careful analysis. Why is the dream so oblique? Therefore, in the next second part, we will talk about the mechanism of dream formation. Freud found through research that those dream desires that emerge after analysis are often rejected in consciousness, or people are ashamed to speak out because of concepts such as immorality. For example, in the previous dream of Emma getting an injection, the desire to be satisfied is to shirk one's own responsibility. But when he was sober, Freud knew that his ethics as a doctor would not allow him to think so. And the female patient, also because of the constraints of secular etiquette, tried her best to suppress her longing for that male friend. It's like a publishing house wants to publish a book, but there are some inappropriate contents in it. At this time, the reviewers will return the manuscript and not let it be published. There also seems to be such a force in our spiritual world that censors our thoughts, so that those inappropriate thoughts cannot appear in our consciousness. This spiritual force is called the censorship mechanism by Freud. Not only does it function when we are awake, but even when we are asleep, it keeps the gates on our minds, keeping out-of-the-box thoughts from passing through. It is precisely because of the existence of censorship that Freud realized that our consciousness does not cover the entire spiritual world. In our spiritual world, there is a large area that our consciousness cannot touch. This kind of part that exists in our mental activities but cannot be recognized by our consciousness is named by Freud. Subconscious or unconscious The introduction of the subconscious mind can be said to be an epoch-making event in the history of psychology development, and it is also a cornerstone of psychoanalytic therapy. Freud pointed out that because of the existence of the censorship mechanism, various desires in the subconscious cannot directly emerge to the conscious level. What about these desires? Going back to the analogy of publishing a work just now, what an author wants to express is that he cannot publish because of the censorship mechanism, what should he do? It's very simple, he cannot write directly, but use some rhetorical techniques, such as metaphors, symbols, and puns, to let his expressions bypass the censorship mechanism, and to give interested readers the opportunity to discover their true thoughts. In fact, the work of dreams is also the same as this, which is to change the suppressed and hidden desires in the subconscious in a certain way, so that the censor in our mind cannot see it. It can be fulfilled in the way of dreams. This process is the so-called dream camouflage. Based on this assumption, Freud divided dreams into two levels. The superficial dream content that we can recall is called the manifest content of the dream, or manifest dream, the real meaning of dreams that can only be recognized through analysis is the hidden meaning of dreams, or latent dreams. The manifest dream is like the face of a riddle, and the latent dream is the answer. What the dream interpreter has to do is to see through the disguise of the dream and find the answer behind the riddle through analysis. And to do this, the key is to understand how dreams camouflage. In this book, Freud mainly listed four working mechanisms of dreams. Let's take a look at them separately. The first is condensation. As the name suggests, it means that the content of dreams is actually highly condensed. When you recall a dream, you may only write one page of content. For example, in the dream of Emma getting an injection, Freud found that Emma in the dream was not only a reflection of Emma in reality, 
but also a blend of other character traits. For example, she refused to let Freud check her throat, reminding the latter of another female patient of hers, and the inflammation Emma suffered from in her dream was diphtheria, which was actually a disease that Freud's eldest daughter had suffered from. So Emma in the dream is actually a collective impression. The second is called displacement. That is to say, if some content cannot pass the review because it is too sensitive, then find other elements to replace it. For example, Freud mentioned a dream of his own. He dreamed that his friend R was his uncle, but Freud's uncle was a criminal, and this R was a man of good character. Isn't this ridiculous? After analysis, Freud found that when he had this dream, he happened to have the opportunity to be recommended for a professorship, but he was worried about his Jewish identity and could not get his wish. It is said that his friend R was not able to get the title of professor because he was Jewish. So what this dream expresses is that his friend R is a criminal and that's why he wasn't chosen as a professor, and Freud didn't have to worry about being Jewish. But directly speaking this idea obviously cannot pass the censorship mechanism, so R was replaced as an uncle and appeared in the dream. The third is symbolization. That is to say, unlike our usual conscious activities, dreams are used to express meaning with concepts, so dreams are not like an article, but more like a picture. The technique it borrows is not abstract concept induction, but concrete image to symbolize. For example, your real desire is to revise the inappropriate part of the thesis, and your dream may be that you are planing a piece of wood. This is the symbol. He mentioned many symbols in the book, such as canes, umbrellas, and pencils, which are pointed objects, which are symbols of male genitalia, while containers such as caves, boxes, and boxes are symbols of female genitalia. In this regard, you may ask, why are all the examples he gave related to sex? This actually involves a very important ideological tendency of Freud, that is, pansexualism. In this regard, we leave it to the next section to explain in detail. The fourth is retouching. Because the dream material often comes from different parts of our daily life, and has been condensed, displaced and symbolized, it often appears fragmented and disconnected from each other. At this time, it is necessary to embellish the stage and connect these parts together according to understandable logic, so that it can become a reasonable and reasonable story. Still take the dream of Emma's injection as an example. The core idea of the dream is actually Emma and Freud's friend Otto, but the appearance of these characters alone seems very abrupt, so the dream will naturally create some causes and consequences. For example, Freud is hosting a banquet, and Emma and Otto are guests, so they can naturally appear in the same scene, which is the retouching effect. Through the interpretation of the second part above, we understand that the reason why the content of the dream is confusing is that the desire in the dream has carried out various disguises in order to escape the censorship mechanism, which makes it difficult for us to distinguish its true colors. Therefore, the definition of dream can be further refined as follows, dream is the fulfillment of the desire suppressed in the subconscious through disguise. The third part. Through the analysis of dreams, Freud revealed to us a spiritual world composed of subconscious and conscious. But our doubts remain, what desires are fulfilled in dreams? Why is there a censorship mechanism? And what kind of desire will be repressed into the subconscious? This is also the question we will answer in the third part. In fact, in the previous analysis, we have seen that dreams satisfy different desires. For example, the child's dream of arriving at the mountain hut is actually satisfying the desire that was not satisfied during the day. This desire is not repressed so the dream does not have much disguise. However, Freud pointed out through research that such dreams of direct fulfillment of wishes mostly only appear in children and rarely occur in adults. The reason may be that children's personality structure has not yet matured, so there is no strict review mechanism and there are not so many desires suppressed into the subconscious. But adults are different. With the establishment of the censorship mechanism, more and more desires cannot enter the conscious level but can only sink into the subconscious. These subconscious desires contain huge psychological energy. On the other hand, those desires that can emerge into consciousness during the day are not strong enough to form dreams, at best they provide some material for dreams. Therefore, for adults, only the desires suppressed in the subconscious can have enough energy to form dreams. 
This is also an extremely important assumption of psychoanalytic theory. Mental activities also require energy. This energy is called internal drive by Freud. What is the most important internal drive? Freud said that it is sex, which is one of the most important instincts of human beings. He observed and recorded a large number of dreams, and found through analysis that many symbolic elements in dreams have sexual connotations. For example, as we mentioned in Part 2, sharp objects tend to symbolize male genitalia, while hollow objects symbolize female genitalia. Moreover, Freud further pointed out that the sexual desire that appears in this dream does not appear in adulthood, but has been gradually formed in childhood. The most representative example is Freud's belief that children will have love and even sexual impulses for the parent of the opposite sex, while they will have a sense of competition and hostility towards the parent of the same sex. He borrowed the name of Oedipus, the king who killed his father and married his mother in Greek mythology, to name this psychological tendency, which is the famous Oedipus complex. The reason why this sexual impulse is repressed is that children are afraid of being punished, and in the process of growing up, this fear of punishment is generalized into various moral, normative, and ethical constraints of society. As for the censor who guards the gate of consciousness, it is actually the internalization of this external morality and value concept in our spiritual world. In the case of the female patient who dreamed that her little nephew died, the female patient would rather bear the pain of the death of her relatives than directly realize her desire to meet the person she likes, because this desire violates the secular moral norms. It is worth mentioning that after initially proposing the concept of censorship mechanism in the book The Interpretation of Dreams, Freud further developed and deepened it in the future, and finally made this hidden in our hearts, the power that regulates our behavior through internalized morality is named the superego. In contrast, those instinctive impulses and desires that are repressed in the subconscious are called ID. This division of personality into different functional structures is exactly the psychoanalytic personality structure theory. It, together with the previously mentioned subconscious theory and psychological drive theory, are also known as the three cornerstones of psychoanalysis. To this day, it still plays an important role in the fields of psychology and psychotherapy. And the rudiments of these theories have already appeared in this The Interpretation of Dreams, so it can be seen that it is no exaggeration to say that this book is the first of its kind in psychoanalysis. At this point in the explanation, the key content of the interpretation of dreams has been introduced, and we will give a complete summary of the concept of dreams. Dream is a unique mental activity as important as any mental activity, and its essence is the satisfaction of desire. In order to bypass the censorship mechanism, Various disguises were carried out in the process of dream formation either by condensing or replacing the materials, presenting sensory images with symbolic techniques, and rationalizing the structure of dreams through embellishments. As for the desire in the dream, it mainly comes from the repressed content in the subconscious, the most important of which is sexual desire. The book The Interpretation of Dreams was first published in 1900. Today, how should we view Freud's theory put forward more than 100 years ago? First of all, we must objectively realize that Freud's viewpoint is not a universal truth, but a hypothesis based on observation and analysis, which inevitably has limitations and errors. Psychoanalytic theory has been controversial since its inception. In particular, Freud's excessive exaggeration of sexual drive, and his pansexualism that everything must be related to sex, even his successors disagree. For example, Adler, Young, Frum, Horney and others all modified and expanded psychoanalytic theory from their own perspectives to make it more realistic. However, this is not to negate the contribution made by Freud. He explored the spiritual world of human beings with a rational and objective attitude, instead of resorting to religion and mysticism. His insight into human subconscious psychology, functional analysis of personality structure, and discovery of psychological driving force are still widely used in psychotherapy and other fields even today when psychoanalysis itself has declined. New genres such as psychology and personality psychology. More importantly, psychoanalysis is not only an academic theory or treatment method, but also penetrates into the fields of society, culture, art and philosophy in an all-round way. In this regard, some scholars have lamented that without psychoanalysis, Western thought would be unimaginable. 
This is why Freud occupies an important position in the history of Western and even human thought. But while the cultural influence of psychoanalysis cannot be ignored, the scientific validity of the theory has always been contested. There is a common view, even in psychology, that psychoanalysis is outdated and that Freud's theories are not science at all, but pseudoscience. For example, Stanovich, the author of the book This is Psychology, directly classified psychoanalysis as pseudopsychology because Freud's research was only based on individual case analysis, without a control group, and without controlled experiments, let alone be repeatable, which does not conform to scientific positivism. So Freud's set of things cannot actually be tested through observation in reality. In other words, these theories cannot be falsified, so how can it be science? Indeed, according to the methodology of traditional natural science, psychoanalysis can hardly be called science. But we should also realize that psychology is different from physics after all, and even different from brain science. What it studies is the inner spiritual world of people. And it is precisely difficult to measure and observe the human heart with this empirical method. Therefore, in order to pursue scientificity, some schools of psychology such as behaviorism will clearly claim that they do not study people's feelings, perceptions, thinking or even emotions, and do not explore people's spiritual world, but only pay attention to external behavior patterns, because only behavior is the essence of human beings. Observable. But in a sense, it is also the obsession with positivist methodology that has brought a huge crisis to modern psychology. Psychologists who are bound by positivism no longer pay attention to such issues as the good and evil of the human heart, nor do they pay attention to the spiritual life of people. They use the method of studying people to study people, ignoring the dignity and value of people. Today's psychology is indeed getting closer to science, but at the same time, it is also getting farther and farther away from people's hearts and real life. Although modern psychology has many branches and develops very rapidly, it has never been able to produce influential figures or schools that can surpass Freud. Although psychoanalysis has been abandoned by mainstream scientific psychology, when the general public encounters psychological problems and needs answers, they still think of psychoanalysts such as Freud, Adler, and Jung first. This phenomenon itself is intriguing. This is the end of this episode of the show. What do you think about it differently? Welcome to leave a message to discuss with everyone. Hey, if you like our channel, please subscribe us. Haha, <laughs> remember to like it.